which I am now sharing. Yes. Uh, all right, good, thank you. For some reason, I think I've lost all of your faces, but I'm gonna trust that you are, that you are there. Um, and I wanna begin uh, by going up, this is on Safaria. And uh, the truth is, is one of the nice things about this medium is that um, I can actually not only share the screen, but in the chat, I'm gonna even put a link to the screen. Uh, that's of course, if I can get back to my thing, let's see. Nope, it's not pulling up my chat. All right, well. It's hard to uh, it's, it's, it's fuzzy, Alan. Rabbi. It's fuzzy? Yes. Hmm. Well, I don't know what to tell you, but uh, I will try and explain everything as we go along, okay? Um, okay, great. It is legible, it is legible. Oh. Okay, good. So in this week's Torah portion, uh, we have many, many things, uh, continuation of the census, the description of the Sota ritual, the description of the Nazir ritual, um, and then after uh, we have uh, some, some more material, but the, I really just want to focus on a few very, very important verses. Um, and they are on your screen. Daber vayidaber Adonai Moshe lemor. Daber ala haron ve'albanav lemor. Speak to Aaron and his son saying, Ko tibarachu ebnei Yisrael. Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. Amor lahem, say to them, and then these famous, famous words, Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmarecha, Ye'er Adonai p'anav elecha v'chunecha, Yisa Adonai p'anav elecha v'yasem lecha shalom. It's almost impossible not to uh, respond to that, to react to it by, uh, by, by saying, Ken Yihiratzon, and then the, the verses can conclude, V'samu et shmi et b'nei Yisrael, and thus shall they, uh, it says they shall link, but Thus shall, shall my name be placed upon the people of Israel, Ba'ani of Archem, and I will bless them. Um, by the way, I'll just say very quickly this idea of Visamu et Shemi, my name will be placed upon them. Um, the many uh, scholars have come to understand that this was actually quite literal in the time of the Bible. Um, and it's related to this next thing that we're going to look at, um, which is a. Um, it, it is an, uh, a fragment from an amulet that was found, uh, and I'll let Eric say more about this. Eric, if you can uh, take yourself off mute. Hold on, I wanna see if, nope, let's see. Uh, is it back up? Yes, okay. Yep. Uh, so this was found in an amulet, and the idea scholars have helped us to understand that these, the words of this blessing were actually uh, uh, worn, um, probably around the neck uh, in some way, but um, were literally placed upon us, uh, similarly to the way that the tefillin are placed on our arms and on, uh, on our arm and on our forehead. Um, Eric, would you tell us what we are looking at here? Yes, we are looking at a silver amulet, which for decades was undeciphered and unopened, but through the excellent conservation services of the Israel Museum, it was ultimately opened and read, and it happens to be the Birchat Koranim, the, the priestly blessings from Numbers 4, and is virtually identical to what you read in our, uh, in our Parsha this week, and really is the oldest attestation of biblical verses outside of the Bible. It's and it dates to the late seventh century, 620, 630, something like that, before the common era. And it's from a tomb, and it was on the chest of the deceased, where no doubt it was worn in life as in death. And um, it's called Ketev Hinnom, the Hinnom Valley, Gay Hinnom, Gehenna in, I guess, Latin. So if you know the Scottish hospice not too far from the King David Hotel and you look over the back side of that, that's the, that is the southwestern corner of the Hinnom Valley. And that's where this 
Jewish Israelite tomb was found and excavated over 25 years ago. And uh, I, I told Rabbi Graber that it, it is so beautiful that the oldest piece of scripture found <laughs> in the world that exists is this absolutely gorgeous blessing that has been adopted by Jews and Christians alike for worship. And it, we need it today. We need these words of blessing more than ever. So it's extremely valuable. And those who have been to Israel with me, as many of you have, Carol and I make sure in the Iron Age room where all the beautiful finds are from the first temple period, the culmination is this tiny little vitrine in the corner as you're exiting. And there are these amulets. And when everyone realizes how old they are and what it says, everybody really gets excited. So this is a special Shabbat for that reason and uh, how fortunate we are to have this ancient piece of silver and the Birkat Akone preserved for all time. It's just an amazing discovery and uh, I hope it brings, as an amulet should, I hope it brings us good luck from this time of despair. <laughs> I mean, and uh, and I, I will just share, I'm going to go back to that text in a minute, um, but I will share with everyone a, a wonderful homily from, from my teacher and friend, Rabbi David Wolpe, uh, who points out that the word Gehenom, uh, Gehenom, um, in certainly in modern Hebrew, and but also in rabbinic texts, is the Jewish word for hell. Uh, it was, and so what we have here, quite extraordinarily, is a blessing that was plucked from the depths of hell. Uh, and it's just an extraordinary thing to, to think about, um, that the oldest piece of text that we have um, is this blessing that was found um, in literally uh, a place that bears, uh, that bears such a difficult name. And and perhaps a, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, sign of hope uh, for this morning. Um, so I want to thank Eric, who, who uh, you know, who wrote me a nice uh, note that I included on on my source sheet um, as one of our, as one of the sources from this morning. Um, but it was wonderful to to have him share that. And I want to take a moment uh, this morning and. Um, and see if we can, uh, well, and just share with you a beautiful teaching that I learned this past week um, about Birkat Kohanim um, with, uh, with my favorite commentator, Kli Yakar, and I learned this with, the, uh, with my Kavruta, Shalom Goldman. Uh, he and I continue to learn, and he and Lori were our teachers on, on Shavuot. Um, so I want to walk through this passage, um, first the comments of the Kliyakar, and then uh, suggest one way in which perhaps the teaching of the Kliyakar can begin to give us some um, resources to, uh, to move forward from this week, um, which has uh, unfolded in the world, um, week, two weeks from um, from this place where we find ourselves. So uh, I want to just now share again um, the Kliya Kar. Uh, I won't read all the Hebrew, um, but he, in explaining the passage of the Birkad Kohanim, he says, Ve'altzad uh, haremes, by way of hint, uh, we can understand a little bit of this, uh, a little bit of the Birkad Kohanim, um, by way of a midrash, and it's a midrash that he actually explains in more form, uh, in further detail in Parshat Yitro. Um, it's found in Shirashim Rabbah, Shirashim Rabbah, and it's a midrash in which um, we read that the that God at one point um, calls Israel um, first daughter, and then sister, and then mother. And he teaches that these three 
names for the Jewish people, kol zemoreh al ha teach us something about memshala is the modern Hebrew word for authority, uh, excuse me, for government. Um, but, you know, let's think about it. In, it teaches us something about authority. Um, he says, at first God called Israel daughter, okay, and I want to apologize for the extremely gendered uh, uh, nature of, of his teaching, um, but he says, Let a father rules over the daughter. I think he would agree that, uh, that both fathers and, uh, and mothers rule over their children um, and rule over, exercise control, take, have authority over them, and um, and he explains, uh, he is above, the father is below, and the, and the, and the daughter is below, and, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, an up-down hierarchy uh, of the parent-child relationship, um, and he says, that's why the verse says, may God bless you, Yevarecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, um, and keep you, that, and, and he says that Israel, Israel may draw a flow of blessings from above, and God guards Israel, guards you for, and he um, bases this upon a verse, for every, um, every guard or guardian is above the one who is guarded. And he takes this from a, verb in pro, a, a verse in Proverbs where it says, when you walk, they will guide you. That's more of a side-by-side -side thing. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And the, and the verse is, Tishmor Alecha, um, which, is, which has a sense of being over you. And again, that, that up-down. So the, the first part of Birkat Kohanim, he says, teaches about an up-down relationship between uh, God over us and Israel uh, and, and Israel below. Next, God calls Israel achot. Okay? Next, God calls Israel sister. Um, and this is quite extraordinary. Kara achot bedome lo al madrega. Meaning, uh, God calls Israel sister to explain that we are similar to God in status. Mm. All right, that's quite an extraordinary statement that we are opposite and equal to God. Um, and therefore, the second blessing reads, Ya'er Adonai Panav Elecha, may God's shine face towards you. And it really shouldn't say upon you, um, because Elecha uh, is really, may God's face shine towards you. And it does have that sense in the Hebrew of on your level, opposite him, opposite God, face to face, just as the moon receives its light from the sun, um, opposite and equal in status. And so each one of these, there is a way in which we relate to God, certainly as greater than we are. Um, but there's also a way in which we relate to God um, as an equal, um, as partners. We are co-creators, as I talked about in my uh, bulletin article. We are co-creators with God. Um, but the final one is really why I brought this to you this morning, because it is astounding. It is absolutely astounding. I, I hope you'll agree with me, but, but I believe that. It says, kara et, uh, aim. The last one in this midrash says that Israel, that God calls Israel mother, okay? That God calls, uh, in all of my, you know, uh, studies of the Jewish tradition, it's not so often that we come across a name of God of, uh, uh, where, where, where we are called mother, and that means that God is in, in relation who rules over the daughter, that God is our daughter, Okay. And, and he says here, just as the tzaddik rules, I shouldn't say over fear of God, but this is a, a quotation from the uh, final words of David from Second, uh, Second Samuel, that, um, that uh, the one, the tzaddik, the righteous one, um, rules with fear of God. But here he's saying 
that the that the righteous one um, rules uh, over uh, the fear of God, um, having a sense of of human beings actually ruling over God. Um, and he says, just like the da- the eyes of a daughter are lifted up towards the mother, so too. And then listen to this last this last third part of the blessing. The third part of the blessing says, "Yisa Adonai Panav Elecha." God, we ask, we pray, we bless that God lifts up God's face to you. And he has to use this word, it's a, a good rabbinic word, kibiyachol, right? Which means, it, you know, if such a thing can be said, right? Um, but he, he has to say it because, uh, because the Midrash says such a thing that God is beneath us and, and God must lift up God's face towards us. And it is when that happens that we should have peace. Right. Right? Um, an extraordinary teaching about the lesson, about the, about the language. And he says, one should not dwell at length on these words, right? This is a little too radical, right? Don't spend too much time thinking about it. But he says, <laughs> to those who find knowledge, they will make sense. They're going to be, it's going to make sense. And when I was learning this teaching, it reminded me of another very famous Rashi that we find in the book of Genesis. Uh, on the verse, Nase Adam Bitsalmenu Kidmutenu, where God, uh, the, at the end of the uh, Genesis 1, says, let us make human beings in our image. And the commentators are all confused because they are wondering, uh, who is the us? I thought that there was only God who was creating and who, with whom is God partnering? And Rashi explains this in the following way. He said, although they, and he's referring to um, uh, either other gods or other heavenly powers, although they did not assist God in forming the human being. And although this use of the plural may give the heretics an occasion to rebel, to argue in favor of their own views, meaning by, by, by using the plural language, the Torah actually risks the implication of polytheism. Uh, and, and, and yet, the verse does not refrain. Why, not, why does the verse not refrain? It could have made things much simpler for God and the Torah if the verse had just said, E'ese Adam, I will. And yet, it uses the plural, why? <sighs> Friends, I just I want to dwell here for a moment. Why? It doesn't refrain in order to teach us the verse does not refrain from teaching proper conduct and the virtue of humbleness, of humility. Namely, that the greater should consult and take permission from the smaller. That the, that the proper conduct is when the greater takes permission from the smaller. For had it been written, I shall make man, we could, not have then, we could not then have learned that God spoke to God's judicial counsel. Um, so I want us to look at this image for a moment. And I want to now share a different screen and pull up a video. Um, I realize that I don't typically share videos on Shabbat, but we are already in this medium, and so I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity to look at two videos with you. First of all, um, this moment uh, that occurred in Fayetteville this past week.
look at one other video that explains what led to that moment. with the Clea car and Rashi and the words of the Torah and the words of Eric Myers and the fragment of that scroll. I have placed another one of the holy teachers his name is Josh Wiley. I deal with situations like that every day working at the Scotland Correctional. So the first, you know, normal reaction is violence. That's the easy part. The hardest part is actually to have a conversation. The Fayetteville Police Department he tweeted this video said as a show of understanding the pain that is in our community and our nation regarding equality, the Fayetteville Police Department took a knee to show that we also stand for justice for everyone. We are committed to listening and treating everyone with dignity and respect. Friends, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Loud and clear. The title The title that I gave this shiur is If God Can Kneel, why can't we? God forbid, I want to just make very, very clear, in no way, shape, or form am I implying any sort of superiority, any sort of actual superiority on behalf of people who are not African-American people and people who are, that's not my implication is to say that in that moment where the police are in a position of authority, that they brought healing through kneeling. And that John Wiley had that instinct of the way in which you create healing is not through violence, it is through having a conversation. And having a conversation begins with the sense of, I have something to learn. I could be wrong. The, the assumptions that I have about the world aren't necessarily correct, and therefore I'm gonna have a conversation because I'm gonna open my ears and I'm gonna open my heart and I'm gonna listen.
and there's so much pain. And there's so much healing that's needed. And the beginning of what we so desperately need is to be able to loosen the earth a little bit in which we are so firmly rooted and to say, I might be wrong. You can say that America is an amazing and wonderful place and say that this country was founded with a terrible, sinful legacy called slavery. And that it's not just wiped away by moving forward. And it doesn't make us less to listen and to acknowledge the horrific stains and pain and injustice that is experienced day after day, week after week, year after year, decade after decade, century after century by people who are our fellow Americans, who are our brothers and sisters. It doesn't make us less. Not only can it bring healing, but it, it, it makes us greater because we follow, we walk in the way of the Holy One, whose whole project, you could make an argument, a good argument that the whole project of the Torah, that everything that God wanted to do with the Torah and creating the world and, and all this was to say, I want people to know that there's one God, that there's one law, that there's one justice, and God puts that whole project at risk in the very beginning of the Torah by using a plural. Why? Why give an opening to heretics who might say, look, look, there's two, not one. It says, and God says, no, 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 no. I need people to know that I consult with those who I feel are lower or that have less power. I need people to know that that's what I do, that I, God, listen, that that's my way. I need to teach people that that is the way forward. And I'm going to risk the whole project because maybe the whole project doesn't mean anything that you prove that God is one if you haven't showed people the right way to act, which is to kneel and to listen and to recognize that we don't have all the answers. And that some people are suffering and in desperate pain. My friends, tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, I invite you to log on and to show up for the services of the River Church Congregation, a congregation that is not all but predominantly African American, a congregation whose pastor I had the honor to travel to Israel with on a life-changing trip with other African American pastors and rabbis, a congregation 
who've davened with us on a Friday night in the Trinity Avenue Presbyterian Church and a congregation with whom we've davened, that we've been in their sanctuary and with whom we've broken bread and with whom, were it not for the COVID virus, we were to travel together to Washington, D.C. just a month ago to visit for an afternoon the U.S. Holocaust Memorial and for an afternoon the African American History Museum. The idea behind that trip being we are not weakened, we are strengthened and we are deepened and we grow in our faith by listening and hearing other people's stories. And so tomorrow morning I have told Bishop Gabi we are not there to be recognized. We are not there to speak. We're not there to raise our voices. We are there to listen, to hear you. But most importantly, to bear witness and to say, we are with you. And it would be the right thing to do regardless. But I want you to know that this is a congregation that was there for us when Pittsburgh happened. There were people who were there for us and just by virtue of Hakarat HaTov, of, of, of acknowledging good, which is done for us, the, the smallest thing that we can do is to show up and to to give them the message, you are not alone. When we see an African-American man being suffocated to death by a police officer with his knee on his neck for nine minutes and nobody doing anything, we stand and say, my God, I'm so sorry that that happened in this country. And we're not going to let that moment pass without you knowing that it, it doesn't speak for us and it doesn't speak for God and it doesn't speak for what we want and need to be in the world. And it's unjust, it's wrong. And we need to show up and to say that. Not through proclamations and there's plenty of political work to do and I'm not here to give you a good op-ed about policy, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just here to say, there are friends of ours who we love and who we should stand next to because it's the right thing to do and because they stood with us and because we can grow. And we can walk in the footsteps of God. And on Wednesday, 7 p.m., we're going to hear, we're going to listen and hear from Bishop Godby and hear from another beautiful, beautiful human being, friend who I also met on this wonderful trip, the Apostle Aramis Hines, who's in Detroit, has seen that community go through trials and tribulations and who posted a beautiful video on Facebook that I shared and that meant very much to me and we'll hear from him and, and we'll listen. And listening will be good for our souls. My prayer, my prayer for for our country, we we read the, these words every week on finish by by reading this prayer that we read every Shabbat. It's in the new 
Sidur Sim Lev Shalem Adonai, God, whose spirit is in all creatures, we pray that your spirit be awakened within all the inhabitants of our land. We pray that you uproot from our hearts hatred and malice, jealousy and strife, and racism. We ask God that you plant love and companionship, peace and friendship among the many peoples and faiths who dwell in our nation. We ask that you grant us the knowledge to judge justly, the wisdom to act with compassion and the understanding and courage to root out poverty and racism from our land. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Chavre, we're going to offer a Misha Bera for Cholim as well. A prayer for those who are ill in our community. If you have a name that you want to include, I'll read our community's names and then I invite you to say a person's name in Hebrew or in English, and if you feel comfortable, your relationship to them.